Hi, welcome to the video lecture on linear mixed effect models for language and speech sciences. My name is Mo and I'll be taking you through the journey of today's lecture. In this video lecture, I'll be talking about why we need to use LME models and when to use them. I'll be talking about some very basic concepts and the terminology used in LME modeling. And, I'll, and then I'll talk about the modeling itself, uh, the different stages we go through during modeling. And finally, I'll talk about the issues surrounding power analysis and the interpretation of results. The question which many people might ask themselves while they start using LME models is that why should I use LME models? I mean, I've been using t-tests, ANOVAs, and simple regressions for a while, and I'm good. There is nothing wrong with these tests, and LME models are actually an extension of these tests. LME models have certain advantages over classic linear models such as um, simple linear regression and ANOVA. You have probably seen research studies where the design is hierarchical or multi-level. For instance, uh, think of a study where you want to collect data on kids at a school and then you have eight school overall to cover. If you look at the data for each school here in this figure, let me enlarge it for you. If you look at the data for each school here, you see that the data within each school are more similar to each other than the data coming from other schools. For example, look at school number one, school number six. You see that the data is fairly clustered within each school. The classic linear models, such as simple linear regression, cannot take into account the data structure of these types of research studies. However, LME models are designed to take into account these types of structures, I mean data structures, in the study. One, one further advantage for LME models is that LME models are perfect for repeated measures designs where the data points are not independent from each other. Remember, independence of observation is one of the assumptions for classic linear models such as um, simple linear regression. And basically, in repeated measures designs, this principle is violated. However, LME models are designed to take this dependency into account by including different types of random effects in the model. I talk about random effects later on. LME models can handle missing data very easily. So, I mean, missing data is not really a problem when it comes to LME models. LME models can be used properly with unbalanced designs where you, where you don't have the same amount of uh, data, I mean, for each level of one variable in your study. So, LME models are perfect for this type of designs. Okay, let's see how LME models could be useful by talking about a hypothetical study. I usually refer to this study during the course of the presentation. So this is a study where we're interested in studying whether psycholinguistic properties such as word frequency, word family size, and AOA of a word could influence naming latency 
among a group of people with aphasia. Suppose we need to collect data from several clinics across the city here in Hong Kong, and we also use 100 action pictures from a standard battery in the experiment. If you want to model this type of data properly, we need to use an LME model. Why? Let's look at the data more properly. I mean, this is just several plots which allow us to look at the data more closely. If you look at the data for both participants and words or pictures here, at the individual level, these plots are at the individual level. You could see that the data within each participant and word are highly correlated. You could see that here, this is data for one subject or participant, for another subject or participant. So these are different participants. And you could see that the data is are highly correlated within each participant. The same is also true with action pictures, like you could see different words here and that you could see that the data are again highly correlated. And if you look at the data for the clinics on the rightmost figure here, you could also see the same pattern. I mean, this is not a surprise because the design is multi-level because um, the, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, the design is multi-level. So um, basically we need LME models to take into account this type of a structure in the data. And please remember that this is also kind of a repeated measure design. So the observations are not independent from each other. So again, we use an LME model to tackle this problem. You also probably know that if you study populations with a language disorder, you'll have a lot of missing data in your study. And usually the data points are not balanced across the groups uh, in the study. Therefore, all of these make LME models a powerful solution for studies in speech and language sciences. Okay, uh, let's talk about some terminology in LME models. Um, the first uh, type of concepts I'd like to talk about uh, is the distinction between fixed and random effects. This is really something confusing at first, and there is a lot of debate about it. And I mean, it's not really easy sometimes to distinguish between fixed effects and random effects. So a fixed effect in one study could be a random effect in another study. So there is not a like simple set in a stone uh, one fits for all solution to this. But anyway, there are still some uh, heuristics which enable us to distinguish between fixed and random effects. Fixed effects are the effects which we expect to have an influence on the response variable. These are the effects we are interested in. When it comes to our hypothetical study, for example, for instance, the fixed effects are word frequency, age of acquisition, and word lens. These are things which we are interested in. When it comes to random effects, I mean, these are usually the grouping variables which we want to control in our study. In our hypothetical study, I mean, we already know what the fixed effects are, but since it's a repeated measure study, um, and since there is a, a kind of a dependency and clustering 
in the data, there are certain things that we want to control. One is participants and one is uh, words. In psycholinguistics, usually most of the times, the random effects or the random variables are either subjects, participants, or words, or both of them. So um, a simple heuristic to distinguish fixed effects from random effects is that if you replicate a study, the meaning of fixed effect levels is going to stay the same always. For example, in our study, if we want to replicate the same study, a frequency of 1000 is a still frequency of 1000. Like AOA of 3 is a still AOA of 3. Whereas the meaning of uh, random effects changes from one study to another. For example, subject 1 in one study is no longer the same as subject one in another study or the type of words or the type of words we use in one study are not similar to other types of words we use in a replication study so these are called random effects so a continuous variable cannot be a random variable i mean this is a technical thing in r i mean you might be able to force a continuous variable to be a random variable, but random variables are almost always categorical variables. And another technical observation is that random variables have to consist of at least five levels. Because if you have less than five levels, it's really difficult to capture, to measure the variance among these levels. I mean, R could do that, but the results are not reliable. So a rule of thumb, a golden rule is that go for random effects, which has at least five levels. So here we've got a few examples which could kind of help us distinguish between random effects and fixed effects. So as I told you, in most psycholinguistic studies, in most studies in speech and hearing sciences, subjects or participants are almost always considered as random effects. Like how about intervention strategy? This is really tricky. As I told you, I mean, a variable is not fixed or random by nature. A variable is random or fixed based on the design of your, your study and based on the type of questions you're asking in the study. Intervention strat strategy is one of these tricky variables. So if you're interested, I mean, if your study is going to compare the effect of uh, several types of intervention strategies, then this could be a fixed effect. However, if your study is interested in other phenomena, but you're using different intervention strategies and you want to and you want your model to take this into account, this variation among the intervention strategies, then this could be a random effect. Word length is a fixed effect, education level is a fixed effect, like uneducated in one study means uneducated in another study. I mean, the definition of it is not going to change. Stimuli in your study, if these are words, I'm sure that if you want to repeat the same study, then the stimuli uh, are going to be different, so they're kind of sampled from a larger population of a stimuli or words. So these are almost always random, uh, like countries where the data were collected. This is again a tricky variable. If you're interested, if the effect you're interested in is the uh, countries, 
then this is the fixed effect. However, if you're interested in something else, but the data is clustered within the countries and you want to take this into account, you, you want to control for the effect of uh, countries, then this is a random variable which you need to take into account. Handedness is a fixed effect. I mean, left-handed in one study means left-handed in another study. Okay. Another set of words which are uh, very common in LME literature um, are intercept and a slope and the distinction between intercept and a slope. Um, LME models would allow us to fit one intercept per individual in our data or one single intercept per word in our data. This is uh, great, but this is not really so exciting. The more exciting thing is that LME models would allow us to look at the effects of our fixed effects within each participant. So if you look at here, the figure on the left, you'll see that the model has fit uh, different intercepts for different uh, participants. But the slope is just the same for all of the participants, follows the uh, group slope. However, here in this figure, you'll see that um, we have modeled uh, different intercepts for different subjects. And at the same time, we've got different slopes for different subjects or for different items. This is really, really exciting in LME and uh, is kind of very useful in modeling. It would take a lot of things into account. So again, uh, referring to our hypothetical study, uh, we can talk about a, a design where we only have like intercepts for subjects and items. And at the same time, we can talk about the model where we have slopes too. Like if we're interested to look at the effect of word frequency across subjects, if you're interested to look at the variability and the variation of uh, word frequency across subjects, then we could add a slope to the model. Uh, the next distinction is a distinction between cross and nested. If all levels of one variable are experienced in all levels of another variable, another factor, this is a cross design. Let's think about our hypothetical example where we had like people with aphasia being tested in different clinics. So if all patients in our study would go to all clinics, then this would be a fully cross design. However, if the patients would only go and visit some of the clinics, then this wouldn't be a fully cross design, rather it would be a partially designed um, partially cross design. So crossed means that levels of one factor are all seen in all levels of another factor. In nested design or in nested random effects, levels of a particular factor appear only in one level of another factor. Again, thinking about our hypothetical study, if like only one patient goes to one, uh, uh, one clinic and he or she doesn't uh, meet, doesn't like go to other clinics, then uh, 
this is a nested random effect so it's not a crossed random effect however it's crossed when all the participants all the patients would go and meet uh, almost all of the clinics in the study so as you as you can see here the difference between nested and crossed data is determined by the study design and not by the coding of the statistical model let's uh, look at the skeleton of an lme model we first look look at the intercept and intercept only model and then we look at a model with intercept slope plus nesting so in an intercept only model we kind of have uh, again thinking about our hypothetical study we only want to fit one unique intercept for each level of the random effect so we had two random effects which were subjects i mean our patients people with aphasia and another random effect uh, which was item or the pictures or the words we used in the study and the one here means that we want to fit one unique intercept for each subject or item and then here reaction time was our response variable and frequency of the word was our fixed effect or independent variable however if we want to feed a model with both intercept and a slope i mean it could be like this so we add one more fixed effect which is family size so and then if we want to look at the random slope of frequency which is added here this means this the, the first um, one uh, reads like this that like we have uh, random effects for item and we have random effects for subject but at the same time we want to look at the variation of frequency across every level of subject across every individual subject so that is why we add a random slope so we could add other random slopes like family size to the subject intercept too so if you go to the next line you'll see that we have nesting here because in our hypothetical study like not all not every uh, patient only visited uh, one clinic so that's why our design was not fully or partially crossed rather it was a nested design so that's how we write the the algorithm the formula in r this means that subject is nested in clinic this would allow the analysis to take into account this property of our research design and if you're not interested in the correlation between the intercept and a slope you just put two bars here so but if you take one of these bars and we have just one bar left it means that you're also interested in the correlation between the intercept and a slope so this is basically how the skeleton of an LME model looks like. So we have the dependent variable or response variable, and then we have the fixed effects. We have a plus sign if we're only interested in the main effects. However, we put an asterisk if we're interested in both the main effects and the interaction terms, and then really depends on your research question whether you're only interested in the an intercept model or you're also interested in the slopes and then based on the design you could add nesting or other sorts of things uh, there are different functions and packages in r um, I'm sure that you already are familiar with some of them, but uh, package NLME, package LME4, 
and package BRMS are the most popular ones and then you can find a lot of information about them online. However, if you do not want to use R, there are other types of software which are built on R, such as Jamovi, which are, I mean, very easy and user friendly. But at the same time, these types of software would not give you a lot of flexibility, the type of flexibility you get in R. So that is something that you may need to think about carefully but i would suggest that you definitely start with r and you'll be fine so and then install rs studio it will be even more user friendly now it's time to talk about the modeling itself so far i've talked about the benefits of lme models I've talked about the terminology uh, in LME models, I mean the difference between fixed and random, the difference between nested and crossed. I've talked about intercept models, slope models. So now it's time to talk about the modeling. So uh, before we do the modeling, we always need to look very closely at in our data this is really an important stage and at least for me it always takes a lot of time before modeling to just sort out the data to explore the data to dig into data and to look into data more closely to see like whether we've got any problems in the data or not and then just to make sure that everything is fine before doing the modeling. So one thing that we need to make sure is that we have to make sure that there, are, there aren't any personal identifiers in the data because, I mean, most of the times we want to put the data online, we want to make the data available. But aside from that, uh, one thing is, that's a very basic thing, uh, is that we organize the data in a long format. So we have like items, subjects, and the rest of the variables, and we input the data at the individual level. So it's not average data, it's data at the individual level. So after we make sure that our data is in long format and the data is input at the individual level, then it's time to visualize the data. So uh, it's always good to look more closely into data to see whether there are any like outliers in the data or not, whether there is skewedness or any type of like abnormal kurtosis in the data, whether we need to transform the data or not. These are all like uh, things we need to think about before we do the modeling and there are different functions and packages in r which we could use to visualize our data such as uh, lattice sjplot ggplot2 these are just some random packages i'm sure there are many more packages but these are just a few examples uh, i brought here and then one important thing uh, we need to do before modeling is to check the relationship among our variables because uh, we don't want like strong multicollinearity present in our data because then our results wouldn't be reliable. So one way of checking whether we have uh, an abnormal level of multicollinearity in our data is through variation, variance inflation factor. I mean, variance inflation factor above five could be problematic in our data. So we could easily like plot our data, look at the correlation among different variables in our data. There are several packages in R which would allow us to do it easily. And then we could also do VIF and see whether 
the multicollinearity is above uh, the accepted threshold or not and if it's above the ex and if it's above five then we need to make a decision how we want to solve this problem after looking at your data and making sure that everything looks fine then you need to define your model um, in order to be able to define your model and write the code in R or do it in Jamovi, you need to kind of find the best type of uh, structure which fits your research design. Here is a cheat sheet for LME4 which, could, which kind of gives you an idea how different uh, research designs could be captured in the analysis or in the R code. So if you're just interested in a random intercept in your data, it's usually written like this. However, if you're also interested in random intercepts, you could easily add it here like this. So uh, after looking at your data, and making sure everything is fine, then it's time to specify or define your model. And in order to define your model, you need to be familiar with the, uh, the way they do it in R, the way they do it in LME4 package. It's just one page, and if you want to have more information, you could see the link down here. You could go there and see like, how you can do it by yourself but anyway uh, but you have to know about your research design and then based on your research design you need to come up with the best specification and then after you specify uh, your code based on your research design the next question is, is like uh, how many random effects to include in your model like again thinking about our hypothetical study we've had uh, like three uh, independent variables like frequency aoa and word lens do we really want random slopes for all of these variables or not like sometimes if you want your model to be maximal this is not really possible because we don't have enough data since we can't make it really complex and since we don't have enough data then you might come up with a model which basically cannot be estimated and then there happens several convergence problems so uh, you might I mean the R or LME4 could produce some results but these are not really reliable so to keep it maximal or not is a tricky question which um, you need to think about it very carefully and whether the amount of data you have would allow you to keep it maximal or not it's not always possible to keep the maximum number of random effects in the model because sometimes you come across convergence problem so what you can do is you can do a PCA principal component analysis on your random effects structure and then find out which one of the random effects are contributing the most variance to the model and which ones are contributing the least. And then you could start uh, removing uh, the one with the least variables, variance, and then compare it to the full model using uh, a likelihood ratio test. If the result is not significant, then you can remove that random effect and by doing so, you kind of want to find the most parsimonious random effect um, uh, which fits best with your data. 
Another possibility is to think about whether you want all the correlation parameters included in your model or not. Like if thinking about our example, if we have like random slopes, if we want to include random slopes for frequency, AOA and word lens, do we want the correlation between and among these variables in our in our random effect or not? Because if we want the correlation, then our model would be way more complicated. So it's usually good to start uh, with a model without correlation parameters and then trying to find the most parsimonious model first without correlation parameters. And finally, we could add the correlation parameters and see whether, uh, do a likelihood ratio test and see whether that kind of makes any difference or not. Um, when it comes to the fixed effect structure of your model, it's not really easy to find like which fixed effects are statistically significant if you're like looking for p-values i mean this is not really straightforward i mean at least the developers of lme4 package didn't include p-values within their package so this is also a bit tricky but here you see a list of uh different things we could do to make to see to find out whether our fixed effects are significant or not with this list is from the worst to the best so I mean you could use wall t test you could use likelihood ratio test I mean with likelihood ratio test you could do the modeling backward or forward if I mean the backward one is usually uh, more reliable compared to the forward one and then but it's still some people think that doing likelihood ratio test and the fixed effect structure is a bit anti-conservative so um, it's good to use other tests such as Sather weight and Kenwell Roger approximations where we could find the denominator degrees of freedom and then Based on that, we could also calculate p-values. And then we have uh, bootstrapping, we have, I mean, confidence intervals, which I mean, I'm sure that they're perfect, but they also take a lot of time. Modeling is not always very easy. And most of the times, if your design is a bit complicated, especially uh, you're gonna witness a lot of convergence problems so I mean here are a few suggestions uh, which you could use to see whether I mean the problem it would be solved or not so uh, sometimes some of the warnings are just false positive so uh, R would allow you to fit the same uh, the same uh, formula, the same code with a different optimizer. So it's always good to try other optimizers and see like how your results would be different. So if your results are really different, then it means that something is going wrong. But if you try other optimizers and you kind of get the same results, it means that, I mean, uh, at least you're on the safe side uh, when it comes to the optimizer. It's always good to simplify the model. I mean, most of the times the convergence problems arise because we don't have enough data to fit the model. So we're basically feeding a model with a lot of parameters, a lot of more parameters than the data justifies. So one easy way, as I told you before, is to try to remove the correlation parameters from the random effects structure specifically if you've got a lot of random effects intercepts and the slopes and then kind of including all the correlation parameter among these random effects could make the model crazy and then there comes convergence problems try to 
dig more deeply into the data and find problems like try to use random structures which are justified by your data so that's why that i mean in lme modeling is always good to have a good grasp good understanding of the whole uh, research design so that you could kind of come up with a uh, modeling pipeline or modeling uh, of um, structure which best fits with this type of research design it's good to center or standardize the continuous variables because sometimes the differences between the scales are very high uh, we kind of want to uh, make the scales look similar in magnitude and then there comes the problem of multicollinearity and then if you center or standardize it could also have some effects on multicollinearity too it's good always to see whether you have outliers or whether you have participants with few observations these are also things which could affect the results so you always want to check a model without outliers and to check a model with outliers included and see whether the results are different or not after you defined your model you found the most parsimonious model you fitted the model which best captured the design of your study is good to do model diagnostics it's good to see whether um, your well, it's always good to make sure that your model is not uh, violating any of the assumptions i mean there are several assumptions i'm going to talk about three assumptions here in the first assumption we want to make sure that the variance is kind of distributed equally across the fitted range so this is kind of a residual plot i mean if you look at this residual plot you see that the blue dots are kind of distributed across this line in the middle quite um, um, equally so we we just want to make sure that these dots are not like kind of a cone shaped thing uh, we don't want them stacked in one place in, in this one they kind of look normal because i mean it's, they're just distributed quite equally across the line then we want to make sure that the residuals are normally distributed this is usually done by a qq plot in r and then we, if we draw a diagonal line here the dots should be as close as possible to that diagonal line so in this plot we see that i mean we don't really have a serious violation it seems that it's nice at the same time we want to make sure that the results we have are not just a function of few data points or few outliers the way to do that is like we could do like a cook's distance uh, test and we could plot the results and see like which of the data points are having a big, big effect on our results okay to summarize uh, this part I mean the modeling part so what I usually do is first getting to know my data plotting my data looking more deeply into the data see whether i have any outliers or any strange thing going into data then i think about my research design and i try to come up with the best uh, random effect structure which captures that research design and then i start modeling like uh, finding the most parsimonious random effect structure and then I try to see which of my fixed effects uh, are significant and then I think about 
uh, the convergence problems. If I see any convergence problems, I dig more deeply into the data, into the model to kind of find the problems. After I've got the results, then I do model diagnostics to make sure that my model uh, is not violating any of the assumptions like homocedasticity, like uh, normality of the residuals. These are some of the assumptions that you always want to make sure. It's time to talk about power analysis and effect size. We know that many of the experiments published in like psychology journals do not have the right amount of power. I mean, to go the power below 80% and most of them as low as 30 to 40%. So there was a nice paper published by Brisbane and Stevens in 2018 about power analysis and effect size in mixed effect models. They kind of suggest that we need to have 1,600 observations per condition. It means that like at least 40 participants and 40 stimuli, or you could have 20 participants, but you need to double up your stimuli. So anyway, you need to have at least 1,600 observations per condition. So this is their suggestion if you want to have enough power in our study. So this also depends on the, the magnitude of the uh, difference between the conditions. Probably if the difference between the condition is big enough, I mean, we might not need like larger portion of participants or a stimuli. However, if the difference is already very small, I'm sure that we may need more participants and more stimuli in our studies so that we could capture that difference. They also suggest that in that paper, I mean, we report the number of observations because the effect sizes which are currently reported, they all depend on the number of stimuli presented to the participants. So, I mean, this is also very useful for people who want to do mixed effect modeling and who uh, want to design studies. They also need to think about how many participants and how many stimuli they need so that at the end of the day, I mean, they don't have a lack of power in their uh, study and statistical analysis. Finally, we have the output. The output from the LME4 function consists of uh, uh, several sections. In the first section, you'll see information about model specification. I mean, the type of model we fit for this analysis, you see that we have just one fixed effect, which is AOA, age of acquisition, which was a standardized. And then when it comes to the random effects, we've got two random intercepts, subjects and items. And at the same time, we have a by subject random slope, which is AOA standardized. In other words, uh, we want to capture the variability uh, when it comes to the effect of AOA among all of the subjects, among every individual subjects. And then the output says that this model was fit using restricted maximum likelihood. I mean, it's usually the default option in LME4. We could also fit the models using just maximum likelihood. And then the next type of information we have uh, is about random slips, uh, random intercepts and slopes and the residuals. You could see the amount of variance every individual uh, random effect is contributing to the model when it comes to items, subjects, AOA, their standard deviation, and also the correlation between their 
subject random intercept and uh, random slope of AOA, you also see the residuals. And then the number of observations we've had in this study and number of items and the number of subjects. I mean, in the previous slide, I just said that we kind of needed 40 subjects with 40 items. So here we had 60 subjects and 230 items, which was well beyond the threshold. So no worries about the uh, power of the study. And in the final part, which is about the fixed effect, you know, we've got coefficients and uh, as I told you, the developers of LME4 package didn't include p-values because uh, it's really difficult to calculate uh, uh, degrees of freedom once that, I mean, the, well, it's really complicated because, I mean, just design is complicated and it's not really easy to calculate degrees of freedom. So uh, if we want p-values, there are packages in R which could give you p-values. I mean, based on uh, Satterweight and Kenworth Rogers approximations, or we could do bootstrapping, confidence intervals, or we could basically also do likelihood ratio tests. So we could fit another model without the fixed effect of AOA and compare it to this model. If the result of uh, likelihood ratio test is significant, that means that our uh, fixed effect is also significant. So uh, this was the end of this presentation. Uh, basically, we could talk about mixed effect models a lot. It's, I mean, there are a lot of things to talk about. We just tried to scratch the surface in this presentation, just talking about the very basics. It's way more complicated than I explained. I hope that you like this presentation and please, I mean, feel free to write to me if you've got any questions or you think that I could improve this presentation uh, for other occasions. Thank you for listening.